Great. Thank you for joining the Nearman Practice Management Tuesday evening webinar. Uh, we have us, with us this evening Dr. Kent Smith that will be talking about a very exciting topic that I know uh, we've seen a lot of interest in, and that's CBD oils in the dental sleep medicine practice. So for those of you that don't already know Dr. Smith, uh, Dr. Smith is a uh, sleep dentist that runs two sleep practices in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he's been speaking on many topics related to sleep, both nationally and internationally for the last 15 years. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine and the American Sleep and Breathing Academy, and is also the president of the American Sleep and Breathing Academy. So thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for joining us this evening. And we're so excited to learn more about these CBD oils and the sleep practice. So over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, I, I found it interesting you said learn more. Uh, do you already know something about CBD and sleep? <laughs> uh, Not enough. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to be talking about, uh, well, first, one thing that I need to discuss is why I got involved in this and, and why I have an interest in it, because I've already had a lot of people ask me that question. So I'm sure others were thinking the same thing. And so let me just back up a little bit and say, those of you, I'm assuming most people on the call are involved in the area of sleep. And so we all have patients who come in with an age of 17. They've got some fatigue and sleep, uh, fatigue and sleepiness. Uh, we think, all right, well, hopefully the fatigue and sleepiness will improve once we solve their sleep apnea problem. We give them an appliance. The AHI goes down to 3.2. And we ask the patient, so how's your sleepiness? How's your fatigue? And they say, well, I've still got fatigue. I, I, I'm just, I was really hoping I would feel better with this. And, and you didn't help them because that's why they came in. So it's a common problem. If you treat a lot of sleep, you see it more than you want to. And so I've always tried to find ways to improve those patients' lives. Uh, as dentists, we're we tend to be perfectionists. We want everything to work. We want to fix everybody. And we can't seem to do it all the time in sleep. It's a medical problem and we just can't fix all their problems. So I'm always looking for adjunctive measures to do it. So in December, when the farm bill was passed, uh, it made it legal for all 50 states to grow and to sell CBD oils as long as the state themselves agreed to do it. So at that time I thought, all right, well, here's my chance because I've been hearing a lot about CBD oils for a while. We get patients that come in and they say, yeah, I, I have a, a little joint every night before I go to sleep and that helps me sleep. And it's not even legal in Texas, but as you know, some people do illegal things. And so we've got patients that uh, are certainly anecdotally are telling me that, that marijuana helps them sleep. And I know that CBD is uh, part and partial of the whole marijuana concept. So I was fascinated when it finally became legal. And I said, well, I'm going to do a lot of research on this. And this has now been right at a year. It was December 20th of last year that it became legal with the Farm Bill. And so I've been researching it ever since then and find it very fascinating. I started uh, researching companies. I found one in my backyard right here out of Dallas, Texas, that uh, is based here. They get all of their CBD oils from Colorado, but they're based here. And so I decided to use this company here and started selling it out of the office. And as once we started putting it on the, on the shelves, uh, we started hearing lots of stories. Obviously a lot of patients have heard stories about CBD. They've heard about it. There's a lot of anecdotal stories out there. I would say the majority of your patients have heard of CBD oil. They may not have tried it. I think the last stat I read said about 29% have tried it. Uh, but a lot of them have, have wanted to, but they just don't trust the gas station. And so they, they come into the doctor's office and say, hey, what is, what's your opinion of CBD oil? And so it opens up the conversations. I got into it obviously because of sleep, but in September of last year, I woke up one morning with a TM, unilateral TMD pain, and I'd never had that problem before, ever. I wasn't wearing a sleep appliance, 
And I could not get it to go away. I tried heating pads and, and everything I could think of. And so I even asked the dental forums. I said, hey, what, what's going on here? I'm not a TMJ expert. I'm pretty much a TMJ idiot. Can any of you guys help me with this? And of course, you open it up to the dental forum and you're going to get 37 different opinions. But I tried my share of them. I tried different types of splints and uh, different medications, everything I could think of. And it just nothing seemed to work. So I just said, well, I guess I'm just going to have a, a TMJ problem from now on. Well, fast forward three or four months later, when I finally decided to start working with CBD oils, and I, I said, well, you know what, I need to take this if I'm going to be providing it to my patients for their sleep problems. I need to go ahead and take it myself. So I started taking it, not knowing what to expect. I didn't perceive myself to have any health issues at the time, not even thinking about my TMJ. And about six weeks later, I woke up one day and thought, you know what? I haven't had any TMJ pain in a while. What's going on here? And I had had pain then for about four or five months before I started using the CBD oil. And who knows? Maybe it was time. Maybe it was the oil. I don't know. But I became a, a disciple at that point, specifically because of me. But then I started hearing more and more stories in my sleep practice. Uh, one fella came in, this is the last story before I get, in, get into this PowerPoint, but one fella came in and I always ask him what they do for a living. And he said, well, I work for Microsoft, but then at, at five o'clock every day, I walk down the street and I help out in a, in a family. There's a mom and dad of a 24 year old boy who's autistic. He's on the opposite end of the spectrum that you want to be. He's got the mind of a three year old. He had been nonverbal since three uh, since it's about age four. He hadn't hugged his parents since he was four years old. He, he's 180 pounds. He takes off his clothes and tries to walk outside. He's combative. They have to lock him up. And basically they've got three guys that are with him eight hours a day around the clock just to babysit the guy. They can afford it, fortunately. He said that they started using a CBD oil and this was unsolicited. He just brought us this story and he said, that kid for about five hours is chilled out. He's just sitting there watching TV. He points to the TV and says goofy and says words he's never said before. He's hugging his parents again. I'm thinking, okay, this is ridiculous. There really is more to this than I know. And I don't know how much research there is out there, but I'm gonna start looking into this even more. That, that next night, even <laughs> incredibly next night, we're out to dinner with some friends. Uh, the husband tells me, I'm telling the story to them, and he says, you're not going to believe this. My cousin in California has a 22-year-old son, same exact story. CBD oil has changed their lives. So I thought, all right, there really is more to this. So I started looking at health histories with my patients, and the world opened up. But primarily, I got into this for sleep, and I know that's what this webinar is about. However, you need to know a little bit about where this comes comes from. And so for the about the first half of this, it won't even be about sleep. I know you need to know a little bit of background. Probably most of you don't know a whole lot about it. There is some confusion between the hemp plant and the marijuana plant. So it all starts from cannabis. That's the mama plant. And then you can have different strains. You can grow different strains depending on your desire. Uh, you can have it almost 100% hemp or almost 100% marijuana. Most of the time, there's combinations. Uh, they're, over the years, they're trying to create a more pure marijuana plant. Uh, that's going to have some downsides to it because the hemp plant has most of the health benefits to it. But you can grow a hemp plant without any THC, or I can't say without any, there will be some traces. It has to have less than 0.3% THC to be legal. That's what the Farm Bill stated. In all 50 states, it has to be less than 0.3% THC. Now, there are more than 480 compounds in the cannabis plant. When we talk about a full spectrum CBD oil, that's what we're referring to. We're talking about using all of the compounds, or at least the majority of them. There are even over 100 cannabinoids. The CBD is just one of the cannabinoids. And another big chunk of them are terpenes. So we call it the, the a full spectrum oil because we never know which compound is gonna be beneficial in whatever situation you're put in. 
It's just like if you're in your backyard, you've got 500 keys strewn about the backyard and you've got a lock on the back door and you tell your neighbor, hey, I want you to get in our back door, but you're going to have to find the key in the backyard. That's going to take him a long time to find the correct key. With a full spectrum oil, this is the benefit. We don't have to look for that sole key. We're hitting conditions with the entire compound. There's lots of different cannabinoids, uh, as I mentioned, but there are, uh, these are the different class of cannabinoids. I'm not going to talk about all these tonight. You've got CBG, which is the new guy on the block. You've got CBD, which is what I'm going to spend most of the time about. Of course, THC, that's the euphoric compound that's in marijuana, for those of you that don't know. And then there's CBN, which is found on some of the older marijuana plants that they just haven't hard harvested and they've oxidized a lot. Won't talk about a lot of those uh, other than CBD and then a little bit of CBG if we have time. There are over 100 terpenes. These are just some examples. These are what smell, the smell that comes from various hemp plants. Myrcene is really the only one that will help induce sleep. So if you have a CBD oil with a lot of myrcene in it, it can help you get to sleep. I'll talk a lot more about this in a little bit, but uh, the other ones don't really promote sleep. Limonene, for example, is a stress reliever, helps elevate the mood. Uh, Osamine over here has a mint flavor or mint smell, and terpenaline has a nutmeg smell. Linalool is a large a percentage of, of linalool in these plants, and it promotes an uh, anti-anxiety component. Uh, there's anti-inflammatory from pinene that sure enough smells like pine needles, etc. So there's lots of terpenes, and they all have benefits. They create this entourage effect when they combine with all of the cannabinoids. So the history of cannabis, it's been around a long time. This is not something new. 6,000 BC, it was used as food, then in, with textiles in China. Uh, the first medicinal use was a long time ago as well. And then after that, there was a lot of trade of these. Uh, the different uh, cannabis plants, uh, especially the hemp plants used for, for textiles, uh, but in the Mediterranean countries and in Europe, and obviously a lot of medicinal uses as well. It's been used for, in medicine for a very long time. But I want, I've got a little quiz here for you. I want you to figure out what drug I'm referring to. It was derived from a plant, folk remedy for thousands of years before scientists really realized its potential. It reduces the risk of preeclampsia in pregnant mothers. Have you got it yet? Adjunct treatment for schizophrenia. It's broad utility explained by its anti-inflammatory effects. The next one will probably give it away. At low doses, reduces the risk of stroke and heart attack. It's aspirin. So for thousands of years before we ever realized it had a lot of health benefits, it's been around. And it was a folk remedy. Not many people believed in it. So I think that's what we're seeing in the CBD industry. You've, you've seen it proliferate like crazy. You're, you're probably seeing CB, uh, CBD stores all over the place, especially if marijuana is not legal in your state. This is where CBD is headed. I don't know how many years it's gonna take to get to where it's, we treat it like aspirin, but it's headed in that direction. I mean, how did we even dis discover the cannabinoid receptors in our own body? Well, first let's talk about how we discovered the opioid receptors. Well, we knew that people were enjoying poppy flowers and they certainly were in a good mood when they used opium. And we said, all right, what's going on here? So we, we started looking at our own bodies and figured out, hey, we make some of our own native opioids. So we have a system, we have opioid receptors in our own system and we make our own opioids. Same thing with nicotine. We saw the Native Americans enjoying their cigarettes and realizing that they were using it as a stimulant. We said, well, how does that work? We need to study our own bodies. We found out that we have nicotinic receptors and we make our own nicotine-like molecules. And we don't have enough of that. This is why people continue to smoke because they, their receptors become depleted and they need to, well, we won't get into that. Let's keep going. So think of 
the cannabinoid somewhat like your fight and flight system. So you've got, uh, you've got danger, adrenaline is then produced, it then needs to attach to the adrenergic receptor so that you can then act appropriately. Well, it's got to unlock that receptor. The adrenergic receptor has to be unlocked and it has to fit. It's like a key in a lock. So once that occurs, then you can, you can appropriately respond. Well, the endocannabinoid system has been with you since before you were even born. It's set up to handle these outside influences, these environmental influences that you need to react to appropriately. It's never, it, I mean, it's always in, it, it, it's in everybody, it's in every chordate, every one, every animal that has a vertebra has an endocannabinoid system. Even if you've never been exposed to cannabis, it explains how cannabis works, that the ECS does but it doesn't, but cannabis is not why the ECS exists. It has always existed before we even knew about cannabis. So that's something that's an important concept for you to understand. The way it responds again is by reacting to outside influences. It's a key and lock approach. It's the same thing as the fight or flight. It needs some kind of a stimulus and the body reacts appropriately and creates endocannabinoids in order to fill the receptor and to respond appropriately to the outside influences. For example, if you're hungry, if you're stressed, uh, if you've got pain, that's the trigger for your body to start creating endocannabinoids. And it, when, when you're in good shape, when you have a proper, what we call cannabinoid tone, I know you can't see me, I'm holding my palm up about chest level. If the, if the tone is appropriate, your levels are good, you can cope with stress and anxiety, you can cope with pain, you can cope with an appetite issue, you can respond appropriately to stress. The endocannabinoid system is also a very intelligent system. This is a good graphic that explains this, but as you know, when you've got a stressful situation, for example, giving a webinar for Nierman practice management, all right, that's a stressful situation. So you get a, an increase in cortisol, endocannabinoid, your system learns from that. And at first you create and, and produce and fill the receptors with a certain amount of endocannabinoid, but with each stressful event, more endocannabinoid is produced, which then tamps down the level of cortisol that occurs after each stressful event. So it's a very smart system. Again, this wasn't even discovered until 1992, so it's still a fairly young system that we don't know a lot about, but we're learning more and more as we study this. There are two studies on public speaking and what CBD oil or cannabidiol, CBD, how it has impacted somebody before a speech. And they showed in the first study that pretreatment with CBD significantly reduced anxiety, cognitive impairment, and discomfort in their speech performance. So those of you that do some public speaking, you might try a little CBD oil about 30 to 45 minutes. It works well with anxiety fairly quickly. You don't have to fill the receptors and, and like for inflammation, it doesn't, that takes four to six weeks. With anxiety, it happens fairly quickly. The next study uh, was kind of interesting because it showed that with 300 milligrams, it did make the speaker more comfortable, but it didn't work with 100 or 900 milligrams. So it was very specific for the amount of CBD oil that this, this population was taking. That just means everybody's gonna react a little bit differently uh, however, there are ranges in which you should take a certain amount of milligrams. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, especially when we get to the Q&A section, I have a feeling. The ECS is also helpful in, in getting rid of harmful memories, but also retaining helpful memories. I could go into a lot of detail about this, but we do have a limited time to, with these. With the, this is an important slide here. Uh, CBT, CB1 and CB2 are the two receptors. They're the primary receptors. 
that the cannabinoids bond to, as well as THC. THC bonds to CB1, binds to CB1. We call that the psychotropic uh, receptor because when THC binds to that, that's when you get the euphoric effect. Uh, cannabidiol or CBD does not directly bind to CB1. It binds to an allosteric site and it, it does have an impact on it, but it doesn't bind directly to it like it does to CB2. Uh, CB2 is, CB1 is primarily in the brain and in the spinal cord. CB2 is everywhere else. It's, it's throughout the body, including the skin. Uh, there is also some CB1 receptors in the skin as well. Now the two endocannabinoids, the primary endocannabinoids that we produce are anandamide and 2-AG. Anandamide is the, what we call the bliss molecule. You want anandamide to feel good. Anything that breaks down anandamide is not good. Uh, there's more TA, 2-AG in your circulation than anandamide, but anandamide is an important molecule for feeling good. And the problem is when you've got the enzyme FAAH, uh, FA if you want to call it that, that breaks down anandamide. So one thing that CBD does is to prevent the breakdown of fatty acid amide hydrolase, therefore allowing you to feel better, to feel blissful after you take it. There are five primary purposes for CBD. One is to help in eating with sleep, which is why you're here. Uh, relaxation, forgetting, and then protection, primarily neuroprotection. As I said, the entire animal kingdom, everything that has a vertebra has an endocannabinoid system. And probably most of you have never even heard of it. Uh, they have not studied it in medical school, but I can promise you in the, in the very near future, they will be teaching the endocannabinoid system in medical school. We certainly never learned it in dental school. Dr. Ethan Russo is a in my opinion, the, the foremost researcher in the endocannabinoid system, the ECS. If you get a chance to Google him, look at him on YouTube, look for some of his lectures. He's a neurologist that actually retired from practice specifically to do research on the ECS. He actually coined the term clinical endocannabinoid deficiency or CED. What he did, he found that through spinal punctures in all of these conditions, like for example, if you have fibromyalgia, he could prove that you have a depleted endocannabinoid system. A lot of the receptors are not full. They don't have your endocannabinoids filling the receptors. So what interestingly he said that in one of his lectures, he was saying that if somebody has migraine, fibromyalgia, or IBS, very often they will have all three of those, specifically because of the depleted endocannabinoid system. I don't know how true that is. I haven't had a chance to, to query my patients, but I definitely am going to, uh, this was a recent uh, lecture that I was listening to. I'm gonna be asking my patients that do have IBS, for example, if they also ever have migraines. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. So there are three different cannabinoids. I've already mentioned the endocannabinoids. That's the ones you create, but then there are the phytocannabinoids and that's what we get from the hemp plant. And then there are synthetic cannabinoids. Now they made synthetic cannabinoids before we even knew we had receptors. They've also made some synthetic cannabinoids after we knew there were receptors. But these are the three basic types of cannabinoids. Now, if it's me, I would prefer to use phytocannabinoids than to synthetic, uh, but they are out there and they can be beneficial. Phytocannabinoids, are, they're natural. It is considered a, it, it's a supplement right now. It's not, a, it's not regulated by the FDA. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, and certainly I can answer some Q&A about that. But if, if you're taking, if you're smoking a joint and it's got some CBD in it, this is how you feel. If you remove the CBD, this is you. So CBD is a modulator or a mediator, or it taps down the effects of whatever you're doing. So in other words, you also have to be careful if you're taking a medication 
because it could tamp down the effects of the medication you're taking. That's why I tell patients, be sure and talk to your physician before you take this, before you buy some of this, because I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, if they're not taking any meds, it's no big deal. If they're taking some for anxiety, I can say, well, you can try to take this instead of your anti-anxiety medication, see how well it works. If they're taking it for acid reflux, I can do the same thing. Some things you can be safe with substituting, but you do need to be careful knowing that it can tamp down the effects of different medications. Uh, it's advertising time. Um, we've got this great meeting coming up in March, March 27th and 28th. Uh, as you see in the, the top left four, these are the original organizers of the meeting, uh, Jonathan Lown, Arthur Feigenbaum, myself and Scott Craig. We had our first meeting last year, so this is our second annual and it went great. If you will come out there, I have decided I'm gonna bring a week supply of CBD oil. Anyone that's on this seminar that does end up going to this meeting, uh, I will give you a week sample of the CBD oil just to see how well it works for you. You can test it out. Also, if you register for it, there is a code that will save you $70 on it. The, the meeting is at deltasleepinternational.com. It's at the Aria Hotel. If you've never been there, it might be worth it just going to the Aria Hotel. That's a beautiful hotel. The code is D, uh, no, NPM, Nearman Practice Management, NPM70. So use that code when you register to save, save 70 bucks. I hope to see you all out there. It's going to be a fantastic meeting. We've got the CEOs of all the appliance companies are going to be on a, a panel discussion. We've got a marketing panel. We've got a uh, billing panel. Uh, we've got Dan Taché talking about TMJ. Uh, uh, Dan, if you're listening to this, uh, why don't you try some CBD before you come to that meeting and let me know how it works on some of your TMJ patients. All right, let's move on. There are some contraindications, if you weren't aware of this, of marijuana. There's quite a few. You should not be smoking marijuana if you've got any of these conditions. With CBD, well, pregnancy and breastfeeding, we don't have enough data yet to know if there are any significant contraindications. A new study just came out uh, that, that pointed to a potential problem with liver. Uh, I don't know what that means yet. I haven't seen any statistics, any data to know if it just increased your chances of having a liver problem by 0.001% or if it's even statistically significant. I haven't seen the data yet, but there is a possibility that there's one more contraindication. But for now, this is all we really know about. These are marijuana side effects. Uh, there's quite a few there. Lots of side effects. CBD, very few, but there are many side benefits. That's what we call them. That's why it's a good substitute for a lot of the medications that people are taking because there are certainly side effects with many of the medications people take. And we're finding some good success with these in replacement of those meds. I believe there are four pillars of true medicine before you ever want to distribute uh, handout, sell, whatever, any kind of medication. First, you've got to prove its efficacy. Next, you've got to prove its safety. Next, it's got to be standardized. You have to standardize it or you can't trust what you're buying. And finally, it has to be accessible. If you make it too expensive or too rare for someone to get, it doesn't do any good to have that on the market. There's lots of health studies on CBD. They've been doing these since the early 2000s. Uh, they're still doing these. Uh, well, there's one back in 1981, so they've been doing them longer than that. And this is just a small sampling of them. I can certainly send anyone uh, any kind of study that they want on the efficacy or the, the health implications and, and the, the promising aspects of using CBD in healthcare. There's, there's lots of stuff going on right now. I think every year we're going to see more and more of these studies. Here's one on safety. This one showed that up to 1,500 milligrams per day are well tolerated in humans, and no one is going to be taking 1,500 milligrams of CBD. So I think it's a very safe, in most people right now, it's very safe to take. As far as uh, standardization, the U.S. Hemp Authority is 
has been tasked with doing this. So that's one thing that you will want to look at on any CBD oil is to see if it has been U.S. Hemp Authority certified. You'll see the stamp on the bottle. That tells you that they have certified that this oil has in the bottle what it says it has. You have to be very careful about that. I know there's, there's so much out there. I think a common phrase I hear being involved in this is that you wouldn't buy your sushi at a gas station. Don't buy your hemp oil at a gas station either. So why is it good for sleep? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, it's great for anxiety. And if it's good for anxiety, it's gonna be good for sleep. As you know, a lot of patients have insomnia because they can't control their anxiety. They, they have sleep initiation insomnia. They have sleep maintenance insomnia. And so by managing the anxiety with CBD oil, that's one way for us to help. It's also good for pain relief. Lots of good studies around pain relief. And so we also know patients don't sleep well when they're in pain. And this is the most important thing. It balances our endocannabinoid system. If we're depleted, if we've got receptors that don't have any endocannabinoids, if we haven't been able to produce enough, if we take endogen exogenously a cannabinoid like CBD, it helps to promote homeostasis. It, it essentially balances our body. If we've got levels that are too low, it helps balance. If, it, if we have levels that are too high, it helps balance. That's the way I explain it to a patient. It also, as I mentioned, prevents anandamide from being broken down. That's that bliss molecule I was talking about. So therefore, we can respond much easier to stress, and that's something that all of us could use. And it's certainly better than taking sleep medications. So many of our patients take a plethora of these meds, which can and certainly do have unwanted side effects. Not all of them, but the majority of patients I talk to talk to me about their side effects with sleep meds. The phytocannabinoids also can impact circadian rhythm, sleep wave cycles, they can improve melatonin and GABA production. They work in the pineal gland and on the hippocampus. You know how those are related to sleep. Here's some more studies. This was a study on anxiety and patients with both anxiety and sleep, 72 adults. Anxiety scores improved by 79% and sleep scores by 66%. That's pretty significant. There are certain medical effects with sleeping and CBD oils. What I really want to make sure everybody realizes is that in smaller doses, it does stimulate alertness. It has an excitatory component. So you don't want to take CBD oil unless it has a bunch of myrcene in it. You don't want to take the CBD oil right before you go to sleep. Now, I know some people have told me they sleep well after taking it. They sleep really well, but I contend that's a placebo that they're taking there. They think it's helping because they're taking an oil, but the research does not say that. You have to take about 16 times as much as you would want to take in order for it to have the opposite effect. If you haven't heard of that, it's called hormesis. Hormesis is the effect of a, of a drug at lower concentrations having one effect, at higher concentrations having the opposite effect. CBD oil has that property. It's also shown to reduce REM behavior disorder, and it can help with PTSD. Of course, once you remove some anxiety, improve anxiety in these PTSD patients, they're going to sleep better. Here's another study that talked about the fact that the, the signaling through CB1 improves non-REM stability. We all know it's nice not to have a lot of uh, up and down sleep architecture changes. And so if we can improve that and create a more stable sleep environment, it's going to be better. Obviously, it produces a, a, a more stable endocannabinoid system. Here's a study with rats. Uh, you may not care about study with rats uh, because there might not be correlation with humans, but it was shown to increase total sleep time. And again, increasing sleep latency during light period of day. So what they're saying is this will help you stay awake. You've got a lot of people that, that feel drugged during the day. They feel dopey. They feel, they've got 
brain fog. Um, these CBD oils can help in those type of a patients. Now, why don't we just want to use THC? If we, we've got a state that allows THC, why not just use THC? Well, it has some negative impact. Um, you may not have read a lot about this. Uh, you may know a lot about this, but it does ha have some habituation, which obviously is going to lead to more and more cannabis use. And the big problem with sleep is that sleep disturbances, as you can see here, are the hallmark of withdrawal. It's the main reason that they relapse. 65% of the population that they studied said that they relapsed because of sleep problems. I had a patient, in fact, we're still seeing him. He came to see me and he said, I've just, I developed sleep problems a couple of months ago and I've, I've got to figure this out. And I, I've started asking more questions and he finally told me, yeah, well, I was, I, I was uh, smoking a lot of marijuana. I finally decided to stop two months ago and I've been sleeping terribly since then. I hope he hasn't gotten back on it, but that's one of the hallmark problems with withdrawal. So that's why THC is not the best thing to be using for sleep. And how is it harvested? There are lots of extraction techniques, but CO2 extraction is by far the best. It's used as a solvent. Um, the FDA does monitor these extraction techniques. It likes the CO2 method the best. These solvents are forced through the plant material. It pulls out the CBD as well as other essential oils and lipids. The solvent is then removed and what you're left with is the CBD oil. There's no THC other than a small trace of it. Now, where is, where is it legal? Where, what states are friendly? Uh, there are a few unfriendly states. I'm sorry if any of you are in one of these three states. This map is about three months old so it is improving and, and you're gonna see this turn a lot more green over the years. In fact, if I looked at a current map, we would probably see more green states than we do here and maybe fewer red states. Anyway, it's, it de it's state dependent. You've got to figure out how your state feels about it and whether it's legal to both distribute and sell and even grow. If you want to really uh, go out on a limb here, start growing it in your backyard. You sure wouldn't be alone. There's probably a million people now that are growing this. Uh, again, in December 20th, on December 20th, this is when the, the law was passed by the FDA. They finally separated hemp from THC. And that's, that took a long time to do. We're talking hundreds of years. But each state then has to submit their own hemp program to, to make sure it's legal in their state as well. The future is really bright in this industry. This is from Forbes magazine, trillion dollar industry by 2030. That's a lot. So what are you actually getting when you buy a CBD oil? When you go to the grocery store or the, or the gas station or the spa or wherever you go to get your CBD oil or the CBD company. You know, you really don't know what you're getting because again, the FDA doesn't regulate it. It doesn't regulate melatonin. It also doesn't regulate CBD oil. This one study said that products were mislabeled. They, they looked at a bunch of oils. 26% contain less than what they said. 43% contain more. And an unauthorized amount of THC was detected in 21% of the oils. So if you work for the federal government for any reason, uh, you've got to make sure that you're using an oil that's got less than 0.3% THC. So what you look for in an oil is one that is grown organically. And from what I have seen, almost all of the CBD oils that I've looked at are grown organically. So I don't have to worry too much about that. They also have to be U.S. Hemp Authority certified so that you know you're getting what's in the bottle. I think there's about 35 oils now. I haven't looked lately. I'm guessing about 35 that have been Hemp Authority certified. So that's the first place I would go to look. If you're looking for one, make sure it's on that list. You also wanna make sure it's full spectrum down there. Make it, and, and most of them will say they are. You don't want a tincture. A tincture is just a partial, it leaves out a lot of the compounds that should be in an oil. And then you wanna make sure it's water soluble. And the way you test this, You've got a glass of water, put about four or five drops to the top of it. If it films up on top, and even if you stir it, if it rises right back to the top and films up, it's not water soluble. If it's not water soluble, oil and water doesn't mix, as you know. 
So these companies are tasked with the problem of finding a way to make their, their oil water soluble. If it's not water soluble, you'll only take uptake about 8% of the product. So you have to take a whole lot more of it. If it is water soluble, you're good. The only other thing that's not on this list that I would tell you is the thing that I mentioned before, the QR code on the side of the bottle, or, or maybe I didn't mention it. Anyway, the QR code, you need to be able to take a picture of that that takes you to third party research that tells you exactly what's in that bottle, including the amount of THC. You've got to make sure it's less than 0.3 THC and that it's got in it what it says it's in it. Again, if it's hemp authority certified, it probably has what it says is in it. All right, so we've got about, it's about 43 minutes after. Uh, Courtney, I can move on with CBG, or do you want me to stop here? No, feel free to, to move on with uh, CBG. We've got a, a few questions in queue, but as soon as you're done, we'll get them over to you. Okay, I'll get through with this pretty quickly. So CBG, this is, this is new. This is why I feel like I have to talk about it. This is the mother of all of the compounds, those 480 compounds I talked about, CBG is what originally in the, in the cannabis plant, that's what starts. The brand new CB, the, the brand new cannabis plant has a, has C, is all CBG and it breaks down pretty quickly into CBD, into all the cannabinoids as well as THC. The company can choose to harvest CBG before it breaks down, but then you're talking about a Sophie's Choice situation. You're sacrificing the rest of the plant and all those compounds to get as much CBG as you can. However, CBG has some important components to it that has more uh, health benefits than CBD or THC does. So it's therefore it's more expensive to make, but that's CBG. Um, it also does a better job of boosting anandamide. So that, remember that, that bliss molecule I talked about, it boosts the level of, of anandamide. It's got a lot of other benefits, it's neuroprotective. One thing that I wanna point out here is gut health. That's what we found the most benefit with. That's what I'm hearing most about is for digestive purposes. Uh, it's really good for that. So the way I personally take it, I take CBD in the morning and CBG in the evening, and this will kind of explain why. Um, I'm sorry, CBG in the morning and CBD in the, in, at dinner time. CBG is your on button. It does bind to the receptor. So when CBG binds to receptor, at that point, then CBD can raise the level of the, uh, of the effect. It can Im improve the effect at the allosteric site. So, that's what you're wanting, uh, ideally. CBD can work by itself, but it doesn't work as well on the CB2 receptor unless it gets turned on first. Remember, CBD doesn't directly bind to the CB2 receptor. It binds to an allosteric site. It is the most expensive to produce. In fact, there's only about five companies producing it right now. So that's why it's more expensive. Uh, if you don't harvest it at the beginning and you wait until everything's broken down, less than 1.1% of the CBD oil is CBG. So it's a very small amount unless you harvest it early. Again, one more ad for this. Be sure and register, deltasleepinternational.com. And as a side thing, we also have our 10th annual sleep round table coming up in October. I'd love to see you come out to, to, to that. You So mark down October 1st through 3rd for that seminar. Uh, we have a great time, our 10th annual coming up in Dallas. All right, Courtney, we're ready for questions. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That was just, just awesome information and, and thank you for taking the time. So uh, for all of you on the line, if you have any questions for Dr. Smith, please feel free to submit those to the chat box or the Q&A box that you'll find in the meeting controls at the top or bottom of your meeting window, just depending on if you have it set to full screen or not. Uh, while anybody gets their uh, questions submitted through the chat box and Q&A box, we'll go ahead and start with a few questions that were submitted uh, with the registrations and a few that, that rolled in uh, at the beginning of the presentation. So, um, starting off, Dr. Smith, uh, do CBD oils vary much from brand to brand? 
Oh yeah, and I think you probably got that out of the webinar. They, they certainly do. In fact, in Dallas, the Dallas News ran a study. They studied six of the top CBD oils. Two of them didn't even have any CBD in them. So because the FDA doesn't regulate it, there's just no telling what you have in them. And plus you've got some that are not water soluble. Um, they don't have QR codes to show that, that you can prove what's in it. So yeah, there's a big difference in all the different CBD. There's, I'm sure, I haven't tested all of them. I haven't, haven't bought all of them. So I really don't know, but there's lots of good ones out there. Great, thank you. And, and a nice follow-up to that question. What CBD oil do you, Dr. Smith, recommend and why? Uh, <laughs> you know what, I, I would prefer not to mention the one I'm using simply because uh, I know this is going to be probably looked at even a year from now. And I don't even know if I'm going to be using the one I'm using here from now. I'm happy to tell somebody if they will email me. That email right there comes directly to me. I'll tell you the one I'm using. But I prefer just to say that there are quite a few good ones out there. And if you'll follow what I said to look for, I think you'll be able to find a good one. Wonderful. Thank you. And I know we touched on this uh, during the presentation, but uh, just to expound a little bit, uh, do CBD oils help with just pain or are they helpful with insomnia as well? Oh yeah, yeah, they help with insomnia. But again, I want you to, if you do this, tell your patients to take it in the, in the morning. I have them taking about a half mil in the morning and then another half mil around dinner time and then taking something before sleep that, that, that they may need. For example, I like RimFresh. I, I get that off of Amazon. It's, it's pure melatonin. We know what we're getting because the UK does regulate melatonin, even though the US doesn't. Uh, just like CBD oils, the US doesn't do it because CBD has never killed anybody. And so they're not willing to regulate it until it kills a few people. Great, thank you. And, and Dr. Smith, what is the half-life of CBD? Well, the, the study that they did out of Johns Hopkins showed that, and they did spinal punctures uh, with 12 people over a period of 12 hours, and they, they, uh, they decided they didn't want to submit them to more torture than that. I mean, that's enough. I don't think I would want more than 12 straight hours on the hour. Every hour they did spinal punctures. And if you get the right CBD oil that is water soluble, then it has a, it's, it's not between 85 and 94% uh, bioavailable up to 12 hours. They weren't willing to test people after that, but generally we think after about 12 hours, that's when you should probably take your next dose. Great, thank you. Um, another question here, does the quality of CBD differ with the different flavors that are available? Not that I know of. I don't know that flavor makes any difference. I know that uh, the brand I use, one of them is raw and they have taken that, all the flavor out of it and they call it raw. And the reason they did the raw version, at least from what I understand, is that it's better for pets. There's lots of research on pets and we certainly have, we've got some anxious uh, little Shih Tzus and that get real scared with lightning and stuff. So we have found, we put a little uh, drop or two of CBD oil in their, in their pet food every day. Well, that's great. Um, do you have a, a best recommendation for continuous sleep through the night for a CBD oil? Well, what, what CBD oil is doing is just resetting your, your, your whole endocannabinoid system. It's creating homeostasis for you, uh, so your sleep cycles are reset. So taking the CBD oil during the day should help reset your sleep at night. Now, there's no way for me to know on any specific patient that this is going to help you. And I tell patients that. I say, I can't promise you that this is going to work. There's a lot that we don't know about this right now, but from everything I've read about its use in sleep, says that you should take it during the day to help reset your sleep to basically create homeostasis during sleep so things aren't out of whack. 
But I do tell people to take something before sleep if they still have a problem. Now our company also has what we call a memetic uh, called Dream that we use that has about eight compounds, one of which is melatonin. And so we give that to all of our patients. Uh, if, they, if they get an appliance from us, we give them a bottle of Dream if they have some insomnia issues to see how well it works for them. So yeah, I, again, CBD oil during the day and then something else to help initiate sleep at night if they still have a problem. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, two different questions uh, relating to the administration of CBD oils here. Um, do you ingest CBD or use it sublingually? And um, another one, is it, is it applied ever externally or is it always internally? Oh, good questions. Yep, uh, I'll say all of the above. The internal or sublingual is how we take all the oils. I put a half a mil under my tongue, and, and this is what we tell patients to, and then I let it sit there for about 30 seconds and then swallow. So that's the internal ingestion. However, since there are CB1 and CB2 receptors on the skin, it doesn't have to penetrate much to have an impact. It can help with itching, it can help with acne. There's several good studies showing how well it helps with acne. So it can have a big improvement on, on various skin conditions simply because there are CB1 and CB2 receptors in the skin. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next question here, um, how much exactly do you need to induce sleep? to induce sleep. Uh, I can't remember the exact milligrams. Uh, I wanna say it's 1600 milligrams you would have to take to get the opposite end of that hormetic effect. So it's, it's not really a safe dose to take right before you go to sleep. So I wouldn't suggest taking it right before you go to sleep. Having said that, I know I have had patients tell me that they start, have started taking a CBD oil right before they go to sleep and it helps them sleep. So I don't doubt them, but that's not what the research says. Great, thank you. And speaking of research, we, we do have a, a couple questions here on what, where are some good resources to, to locate uh, some of the research studies that either you have mentioned or that are out there at this point in time? Uh, boy, there, there's a lot of it. Um, if, if, if someone will email me, I've, I've got a website that I can send people to that has a lot of the research on there. That's probably the best place, and I cannot remember it right now. I don't want to take the time to look for it on the webinar here, but I will certainly send it to anyone that asks. Sounds great. Thank you. And um, do you have, um, you know, some, some comments regarding the, you know, retail markup or, or percentages of that um, for the CBD oil? Well, sure. Yeah. Um, we actually do give away some of the mimetic, the dream, but as far as the CBD oil itself that we sell, because I buy it in bulk, I have a 300% markup. It's, it's a pretty good markup. So uh, it does allow me to decrease the price with some patients if I want to, or if I want to certainly sell it to team or some friends or something like that. Um, a lot of times I'm just, I feel sorry for somebody and I give them a bottle just to say, hey, try this and see how well it works. If it works well for you, um, you can always, we, we even have it on our website. And I know some people are concerned about the legality of it. Uh, we have a shopping mall on our website and we sell the oil on, on there as well. Um, I'm not afraid of selling it to patients. I know if you're, you may be nervous to do something like that. And if so, that's fine. It depends on your state. Obviously, you just maybe need to ask some questions. But in, in Texas, at least, it's legal. Great, thank you. And, um, do you have any ideas on uh, what the UK regulations are? We do have some uh, uh, UK attendees with us this evening. Oh boy, I didn't expect that question. I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
I know that in 23 European countries, it's more legal than it is in the US. Uh, in Chile, it's in good shape. Um, I can't name all of the countries, but I know that many other countries, it's much easier to get than it is here in the States, as well as marijuana. Great. And uh, I, I think this might be um, our last one for this evening here, Dr. Smith. Um, could, you, could you revisit quickly the sequence of the CBG with CBD? Yeah. Uh, CBG, if you remember, it actually turns on the receptor. It binds directly to the CB2 receptor. So I want to bind that to the receptor to leave it open. So then I will take the CBG in the morning and then CBD at dinner time. Half a mil if you've got a water soluble oil. Okay, great. Uh, Th thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I think that, uh, you, you know, you covered a lot of amazing content and, and obviously answered uh, a lot of great questions. So, uh, you know, we, we are so appreciative of you uh, joining us this evening and, and sharing this, this excellent information. And thank you to everybody on the line this evening. I hope that, uh, you know, you found some great pearls and uh, we hope to see you at an upcoming uh, Nearman Practice Management Seminar, um, as well as, as the event that Dr. Smith talked about uh, coming up in February here. And um, again, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And uh, um, we hope to see you at an upcoming webinar event very soon.